Amen. Please take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 15. Please follow along. I'm going to read beginning this week in verse 11, and we'll read down to the end of the chapter. Luke 15, beginning at verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off to a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will sit out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, and he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and have everything, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Father, I ask that you would again take your word and I pray that you would give understanding to every mind and heart. I pray that you would give spiritual life to every soul. I pray that you would use your word to call the lost to salvation and to feed your sheep. And we pray this for our good and your glory and for, in Jesus' name. Amen. It has been said that what we think about God is the most important thing about us. What it is we know in our minds and hearts, what we believe about God, that is the most important thing about us. And I think that is true. And if that is true, then we desperately need to learn the message of Luke chapter 15. We certainly need all of Scripture. We need God to show us Himself so that we might think right thoughts about Him. And Luke 15 and Jesus' simple yet powerful stories are relating to us, as we saw last week, relating to us, showing to us, revealing to us the heart of God. It was really a one-point sermon that went on for quite a while last week. And the one point was this, that God loves the lost and rejoices with great joy and celebration when the lost sinners, his creatures, rebels that they are, when they repent and and come home. Of course, that answer 
that principle, that piece of light, is set against the backdrop of some guys in Jesus' life and ministry uh, who just didn't get it. And we saw in verses 1 and 2, while the tax collectors and sinners were told are all gathering around to hear Jesus, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the religious elite, those who claim to know God and to know Scripture and to know how it is to walk with God, who claim to guard the entranceway into fellowship with God, these religious elite, they muttered against Jesus. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so Jesus tells the parables so that we might understand that he represents truly, clearly, powerfully the heart of God to us as sinners. That the Pharisees don't, and he does. This is Jesus' heart on display, and it is God's, the Father's heart on display, because Jesus' heart is God's heart. It is his heart for lost sinners. Please don't forget the two stories that are a part of the three-story parable here. The treasured sheep that the shepherd goes to find, the treasured coin that the woman works so diligently to recover. And of course, today we've got the picture of the lost son who is restored. There are treasured things, things that are loved that are lost. And because they are loved, there's a great search, a diligent and unrelenting search is made. And there is great celebration when the lost is found. All of this is meant to drive home that single point that God loves and rejoices in the saving of lost sinners like you and like me. If you are a Christian, if you've been awakened by the Spirit to your own sin and your need of Jesus, you, your heart is thrilled and warmed at that thought, isn't it? To know that God loves us, loves me in this way, that He came to search for me, and that He took joy in my salvation, in my repentance, and in my coming back to Him through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Glorious truths. But today, we want to see the second point of Jesus' story, which in some respects is the main point for his immediate audience and, by extension, for us today. It is a message to the older brother. Again, don't forget the verse I pointed you to, 15 verse 2. There are those Jewish religious leaders who are upset with Jesus, angry with Jesus, muttering against Jesus because Jesus is welcoming sinners. And so while we might ask the question, and this is really the question we asked and answered last time, and we'll touch on it again today, why does Jesus spend time with sinners? Well, because he has, it is God's heart. This is why he has come. But the other question that comes out of verse 2 is, why do the Pharisees not welcome sinners? To put it another way, what's wrong with their hearts? That they not only are not looking to welcome or restore the lost, they are angry and opposed to those, to Jesus, who is looking to restore the lost. Well, before, we're just going to take a few minutes to unpack the issues of the older brother's heart, and there's important lessons there for our hearts today. I do want to remind you of the, the first part one of the story that begins at verse 11 and goes down uh, into verse 24. Again, we traced it out last time briefly along with the other parables, uh, but it is, again, powerful and beautiful, isn't it? Even as we read it again today. And it's vital to see how it is It really takes a step beyond the first two stories, the sheep and the coin. Imagine for a moment that you are one of the religious leaders, and Jesus tells you these two stories about a lost sheep and a lost coin, valuable things that are lost, and the owners of those things go and spare no expense to recover them. If you were one of the Pharisees and Jesus stopped at that point, you might wonder, okay, yes, people People go after valuable things. People want to recover their valued possessions. Okay. And God rejoices when valuable possessions are found. The point of the story really isn't driven home to their hearts until we get to the lost son. The younger brother, again, we know the story. A selfish rebel who takes all that the father has given him All that he has for life has been provided for him by his father. He takes all of that. He takes it in a way that is 
massively disrespectful to the Father. And he takes all of that and he spends it all on unwise, on sinful living. He wastes it all. He ruins his life with all of those resources. And he's at the end of himself as a Jewish boy feeding a foreigner's pigs. And he's so hungry he'd like to eat the food the pigs have. That's the picture of ruin in the man's life. His rebellion against his father has brought him to that extent. His life really is over. And then we're given that beautiful picture of an awakening that takes place and a repentance. A humbled man repents. And at the heart of that repentance, and we really didn't spend as much time last week there as I would have liked, so let me just mention something here. At the heart of that repentance are at least two things. One, he acknowledges that he is wrong. Father, I have sinned against you, and worse, I've sinned against heaven. Again, I, I recognize that I have rebelled against God in my rebellion against you as my earthly father. So the, the humility and the Really, the faith and repentance expression of the young man is reflected in that primary principle that he recognizes that he is wrong. And again, I don't want to try... (laughs) My dad and I were talking about this a little bit yesterday. We can take these parables and try and teach things beyond what the parable is teaching. So I want to try not to do that, though I suspect I, I make that mistake like most other pastors do as well. I do want to see that all he does is admit that he is wrong. And there's no evidence to suggest that he tried to make any excuses or rationalize. Yeah, I was wrong, but you've got to realize I was a young man. I, I, had, I had to learn some things or, or um, you know, it really was hard. It was difficult living in your house, Dad, and, and I was really wanting to see what the world had to offer. There's no... There's no evidence in the parable of rationalization or explanation or kind of minimizing the, uh, the extent of his sin, his rebellion, his disrespect, both to the Father and to God. There's none of that. He simply says, it's on me. I was wrong. I have sinned. I have ruined my life. And it is important to see that in the Scriptures, and this is a picture of it here, repentance is no small thing. The repentance that the Father delights in, the repentance that brings restoration with God, the repentance that leads to an explosion of celebration in heaven, that repentance is a large and powerful thing. As with a humble heart, we acknowledge that we're wrong. We're out of step with God. And God is in the right. And we have no excuse. None. We have nothing to offer. We plead like this young man for mercy. He recognizes that he's wrong. That's the one thing in repentance. But secondly, and it runs right alongside it, is this principle. He clearly expresses the fact that his sin has... He has, he has forfeited any rights to sonship. It's not just that he's wrong, but, you know, he's recoverable. He acknowledges, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. This is what sin is. It is a forfeiture of our right to anything good from God. We forfeit it. It's gone. In fact, it's not only that God owes us no good thing. He actually owes us judgment because of our sin. And this young man acknowledges that. He is a picture of that for us. And I'm, I'm emphasizing that now, before we get to the older brother, Because I don't want you to think that repentance is just a simple or a light thing that when offered to God, he will quickly look past your sin and welcome you back into his arms and allow you to freely go on in your sin. The repentance that is pictured here in this young man's life is transformative. That's the repentance that you and I are called to. Do you understand that? Is that the expression of your heart? 
if you're a Christian, that the only way to be a Christian is to know that and express that from your heart to God. I am wrong. I have forfeited any right to any good thing from you. I plead only your mercy. But Christian, is that your attitude every day? When you find yourself stumbling and fumbling your way through relationships, through COVID, through restrictions, through whatever it is, and you find yourself under the conviction of the Spirit, you recognize your sin, are you you quick to acknowledge those things again? I'm wrong. And in my sin still, Father, I'm completely unworthy of your love and affection. I don't deserve it. But as a believer, you can cherish it. And you plead again the mercies of the Son, the mercies that are opened up for you through His life and death and resurrection. Repentance wedded to genuine faith is a powerful, life-transformative thing. We must see that. And it is this repentance then that leads to the great celebration, and I won't go through it all again as we did last time, but the father runs and welcomes and kisses and and kills the fatted calf, and he sets out a a celebration. Again, the, the father triggers the celebration. The father is the one without hesitation who celebrates the return of the son and describes it in this way. My son has been raised from the dead. Not only was he lost and found, but that picture of lostness, he says he's back from the dead. And so this father in great joy, knowing that his son is back in relationship with him, he celebrates. Again, ah, at the danger of repeating myself, I think it's a good thing to repeat. In In the story of the shepherd... Right? There's more joy in heaven at the repentance of one sinner than 99 who haven't repented. In the, in the story of the lost coin, there is joy in the presence of angels in the repentance of the lost sinner. Celebration explodes when these, the repentant sinner comes home. That's what the picture is supposed to open up to us. And then this son, this story pushes it further and says, here, here's a a human picture of celebration at the recovery of a relationship. A celebration explodes in heaven. God has expresses his joy-filled heart when sinners, one sinner, comes to repentance. It struck me as I was reading through this again this week that one sinner brings an explosion of joy in the heart of this father. Now, there will be millions of sinners as we think about the mission of Jesus and how it is he has come to rescue the lost, There will be a countless number of redeemed sinners, those who have recognized their need of Jesus, repented of sin, and trusted in Him. We won't be able to count the number that are in glory, that are rescued from sin and brought to eternal life. But the picture here, and really the picture from Scripture is, God's joy is as large in the saving of that one sinner as it is in the saving of the millions upon millions of sinners. And I don't mean that his love is smaller than for the millions. I think the love that he has, the joy that he has in the millions of sinners, it is the same as for the one. Is it? I can't explain it well enough, but does it not overwhelm your heart to think that there is a celebration in God's heart that the God who made you, and yes, the God who was going to punish you, but the God who rescued you because you trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin, that that Father's heart of love is so large, He smiles when He thinks about you. He has joy in His heart. That moment you repented of sin and embraced Jesus, he, there was celebration in His heart, in God's heart, the eternal God, the majestic God, the holy and transcendent, magnificent King of kings and Lord of lords. He rejoiced in your salvation. You are his treasure. Yes, there will be millions, but God takes the same joy in in one. And if I could, I'm sorry, I've spent longer here than I wanted to this morning, but we'll get to the older brother. If I could just remind you that this picture, at the very least, ought to encourage you towards repentance. That God stands ready with mercy and grace, and is eager to forgive those who come to him in humility and repentance and faith. He loves to embrace the lost. He loves to recover those relationships 
and he wants to pour in joy into your life today. No payment for you to make. There'll be no waiting period or silent treatment. You know the way we forgive one another, even in our own homes, even with our spouse. Well, I know I've got to forgive you because Jesus says so, but I'm just going to ignore you for about 24 hours, and then we'll work our way towards some kind of restoration. That's not what is pictured here. That's not the God of Scripture. That's not the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you will confess your sins, He will forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And you are His. Full-blown family membership, full rights as a child of God's house, full unmitigated access to the treasure trove of God's riches. That's yours if you will turn from your sin, repent like this son, acknowledge that you were wrong and that he was right, that you forfeited any, any rights to good things, and you plead only the mercies of Jesus. God's heart and treasure are yours. It's interesting. I ran across a quote this week from J.C. Ryle, and it startled me. As I was thinking about these things and processing how it is God loves us and loves to save, and as I wondered as a Christian, how is it that so many still resist his love? This is what J.C. Ryle says in trying to explode the, our understanding of God's love for us as sinners. He says this, He, Jesus, is far more willing to save sinners than sinners are to be saved. Uh, that's true. Jesus is far more willing to save sinners than sinners are to be saved. Uh, I wonder if there aren't some listening now that by God's Spirit your heart is being awakened and there's a willingness being born. It will only come by the Spirit, but I pray now that your heart will be drawn to this Savior, to this King, and that in repentance and faith, faith you will enter that heart of mercy and grace. That again... I did want to spend at least a little time there because that sets the backdrop for the rest of the story. The older brother. Verse 25, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field when he came near the house, and he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But the son answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me any, even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who was, has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. What is the problem with this older brother? Again, the question we want to ask tied to verse 2 is, what is the problem with the heart of the Pharisees, the religious elite? Because in the first instance, in the moment that Jesus is teaching this, this message is for them. It's for his disciples. It's for all of us. We'll see that in a moment. But the question or this story, this picture is given in answer to the question, they're angry that Jesus welcomes sinners. What is wrong with their hearts? Or why do they not welcome sinners and look to rescue them? Well, let me just quickly trace out the young man's response to his father, to the return of the son and his father. One, we see that the older brother gets angry when he discovers the reason for the celebration. The celebration is for his rebel, wayward little brother who took probably about a third of the property and possessions of his father and went and wasted them all. Now the son has come back and there is a party going on. Now it could be, again, it's not described in the parable, so we want, again, not to press things that beyond what Jesus is telling us, but it could be the, the man is frustrated. Well, the, if the son comes home and is welcomed back as a son, you know, he's going to expect 
more of dad's possessions. That is, his portion might be reduced because the father is now showing generosity towards... There, there may be that kind of selfish inclination in the older brother. We're not, we're not told. All we're told is that he is angry. There is no joy in his heart when his wayward brother comes home. His heart is not like the heart of the father. In fact, he's not only lacking in joy towards the return and restoration of the son, his brother, he's angry, we will see, and frustrated in the response of the father. So do you see the, how far his heart is from the father's heart? He does not rejoice in the return of his brother, and he's actually increasingly upset at the response of his father. His father should be more like him. He gets angry. Secondly, we notice he's described as uh, refusing to go in. The celebration, so the picture is the celebration is going on inside the house. That's where the joy is. That's where the love is being expressed and the joy is being expressed. And the older brother, he's maybe been working in the field. He's outside. He doesn't know what's happened. And he comes and he asks one of the servants. And the servant, likely with great joy, is saying, Hey, you've got to come inside, man. This is a party. The, your brother's back and your dad's all excited and broken relationship restored. And we're told he doesn't want to go in. In his anger, his frustration, and his bitterness, he refuses to join the celebration. That is... He refuses to enter into the Father's joy and delight. He's resisting the Father's heart towards the Son. And thirdly, and most significantly, or at least these things pile on top of each other in the story, he feels cheated. He believes his Father to be acting unjustly. He describes himself as a hard worker. I was obedient. I even, I, I worked like a slave for you. I did everything I was asked to do. I never disobeyed your commands. When you asked me to take care of anything, no matter how difficult, I did precisely what you wanted me to do. Now that in and of itself ought to give us some alarm bells, having read the other parables up to this moment and Jesus' portrait of the Father's heart. Clearly, this man has a distorted, a wrong view of his relationship with his father. He's not functioning as a son in his father's house. He's working as a slave for an owner. The Pharisees have a distorted and wrong view understanding of their relationship with God, or what it should be, Because they slave for an owner. They seek to earn love and acceptance through acts of obedience. I say, well, how do you know that the son here, that Jesus is saying, this son, this elder brother, he's looking for payment, that that's how he sees the relationship functioning? Well, how does he describe it? He says, you're you're given the, the best calf for this rebel son you didn't even give me a measly goat to go celebrate with my friends. Again, it's almost like such a petty thing. Like, Dad, you never give me anything. And when we take those two thoughts together, I've slaved for you and you've given me nothing. The implication being, I slaved for you, you owe me something. And he's feeling cheated. His father is unjust. He believes that he has earned blessing from the Father, that he has owed something. It's not a matter of receiving a gift of grace from his dad. He, he has earned his standing in the household and the reception of his portion of the inheritance. Well, if that's your heart, then you can understand why he's deeply offended when the, the little brother comes home, the wayward little brother whether uh, he introduces the thought of prostitutes, by the way, that's not in the opening part of the story. May well be true. Wouldn't be surprised if that's were the case. But he's just kind of dumping on the brother, I think, at that point in time. 
Be that as it may, he's deeply offended when this wayward little brother receives not just, okay, son, you're back. I'm glad to have you back. You know, really happy to see you. Uh, yeah, let's start. You know what? You stay out with the, the servants tonight, and uh, we'll give you some stuff to do. Uh, I want to talk to you about where you've been and what you've been up to. And, we, you know, you're going to have to earn some trust back. It's going to take some time. And, uh, yeah, so, yeah, you can, you can begin out there, and we'll just see, we'll see how this goes. We'll see if it's really genuine. No, the picture, again, as we've laid it out, is the son comes home. In very genuine humility and repentance, he expresses this to the father, and the father simply welcomes him back, and he, he moves from being lost to found. He is a full-fledged son in the household, and, and given this marvelous gift. For what? Why does the son, why does that son deserve anything? Because he repented? He can waste everything, every blessing and benefit you gave him in this life, he wasted that on himself, he disrespected you, Dad, and he sinned against God, and just because he says he's sorry, you will welcome him back. Yeah. That's what the Father does. Again, the, the complex story of the repentance we were talking about a moment ago. But yeah, he came back and said, I was wrong. You were right, Father. I forfeited my rights. I plead your mercy. And the Father says, great, come on in. This infuriates the older brother precisely because he believes he's earned what it is the Father ought to give him. He sees no need for repentance in himself and yet he reflects one fatal act of disobedience. Did you notice it in the passage? He claims to be the most obedient son, and we have no reason to believe that he wasn't, that he was faithful and diligent in all the work the father gave him to do. But there is one fatal act of disobedience that cuts him off and would require deep repentance. He refused to go in. You see, the picture is the father has gone out before we get to the father's words, the father has gone out. The son has said, no, I'm not going in. This is reported to the dad. The dad comes out. Says, He's pleading with the son. You've got to come in. I want you to join us. I don't want you to be separate from this. Come and enjoy this moment of celebration with us. And, and the father in love for this older brother is pleading with him to come in. And the son's response is, I will not go in. That's a fatal act of disobedience to this father. Not only is his words and actions reflected that his heart is not like the Father's, he has made a deliberate choice that cuts him off from the heart of the Father. And yes, this message is for the religious leaders of Jesus' day. They are outside of God's heart and they are outside of God's house of celebration, God's means of celebration, that is the recovery. They are outside of all of that. Well, they are on the inside of the Israelite history and the Jewish scriptures and the covenant and all of the covenants of the Old Testament scriptures. While they are on the inside of all of those things, while they have all of that from the Father, they fundamentally are on the outside of the most crucial thing. They don't understand what God was doing in the Old Testament scriptures. That all along, God was laying out this plan where he would seek and save the unworthy, the worthless the broken, the rebel. And so they remain outside. They do not understand the relationship that God is calling them to, both in their own scriptures, but most powerfully now in the voice, in the presence, in the person, in the work, in the ministry of Jesus Christ. God the Father is calling them in. He's calling them in. And they are saying, we will not go. That heart of the older brother is easy to condemn, but I wonder if we need to think about it a little bit more carefully for a moment this morning. I wonder, are there older brothers and older sisters still today? And what might they look like? I would suggest to you that they would look like active members of their local Baptist church. They would not just attend regularly, they would attend, if the church was open, they were there. If there was a way to serve, they were engaged. They would sacrifice time and energy to contribute to the life of the church community. 
they would know their Bible. They would know their theology, teach Sunday school and lead Bible studies, and they would give. And they would give, they would calculate the 10%. They would give, generous givers. And yet, they would be impatient and grumpy when the people around them were not nearly as faithful as they are. They would be quick to criticize They would be quick to find fault. They would have their own grid to measure the genuineness of people's spiritual lives and faith and repentance and say things like, well, you can't be a Christian if you do that. Or you can't be a Christian or a mature Christian if you struggle with that, if you struggle with pornography. You can't be a Christian if you dress that way or drink that stuff. You can't be a Christian if you wear a mask. You can't be a Christian if you don't wear a mask. An artificial grid by which they would assess the genuineness of the faith and repentance in the lives of other people. They feel better about themselves when they look at the failures of others. You understand how that's so not God's heart for us? To think better of ourselves when we see someone else struggling with things that we don't struggle with? And sadly, they look for and feel that they deserve recognition and applause. And they are offended when others are recognized and celebrated and they are not. And maybe most powerfully, and in the most revealing way, these older brothers and sisters today have a distinct lack of genuine joy and thanksgiving in their heart and life. Am I too harsh in describing it in that way? Does it make you feel uncomfortable? It makes me feel uncomfortable to think of the older brother and his qualities of heart in this way because it pinches my heart. Certainly there are those who are categorically older brothers. That is, they are not people of repentance and faith. They are very much the Christian version of the Pharisees and the religious leaders of that day. They are, they are that in Christian garb today, and they are very frustrating and discouraging people to be around. And if that's your heart, and in a moment I will press this, you need to repent and enter the Father's joy. But even as a believer... I just wonder, I just wonder if in this life still with the sin that I still struggle with and this heart that I still struggle with, I wonder if I'm a little more like this older brother than I'm willing to confess. I want to, I want to, I'm the younger brother. Yeah, I was a terrible sinner, but I repented and now I'm a child of God. I love grace. Do you? How quick are you to show that grace to the people around you in your life? Both the lost and the saved. Do what, does our heart, does your heart, does my heart reflect the same kind of love and desire, that searching heart that isn't judging and critical? Yes, we can assess. Yes, we will count sin as sin. But we aren't looking to condemn. We're looking to restore. We're not looking to punish. We're looking to rescue. We're not anxious to see people lost. We want to see them found. And we'll do whatever we can in God's grace and power to reach them and to bring them and to see them rescued and to enter the Father's joy as they are. This is why last week I said, be careful of this passage. It's not just a window into God's heart. It's a mirror for you to look at your own. But I need to leave you now with the final words of the passage, which are the words of the Father himself. Let me read them again. Verse 31, My son, the Father said, You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate... And be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Again, please notice that the father goes out to this elder brother, this religious, self-righteous hypocrite. The, The father goes to get him too. 
The father entreats him, calls him in, longs for him to join the family, to enter into his joy and the celebration. And the father in his words shows the son the true nature of the relationship that is open to him with his father. It is a relationship not rooted in the the rigid, uh, self-righteous obedience of a slave. It is a relationship rooted in the grace of sonship and adoption of welcome into the father's arms. He says to him, you are with me and all I have is yours. In a sense, he says to the son, what are you trying to earn? What is it that you're trying to get from me? All that I have is yours. And in a strange way, the story would indicate that in the, in the trying to earn whatever it is he thought he was owed by the father, he actually disqualifies himself from all the things that are his simply because the Father would give them to him. It's a tragic loss. In fact, the Father is pleading with the Son, you don't need to earn anything from me. Stop working for my affections. I love you with open heart and open hands, and I will receive you with great joy. But you must have my heart too. That is the one thing that blocks him from receiving what the Father has for him is the fact that he can't, he can't love his little brother. That's the thing that reveals the the separation that's there. That the relationship with his Father is broken. Again, I wonder, Christian, today, I think we all fall into this If there are days when we are too lazy in our spiritual lives and too lazy in our efforts to follow and and to live a life of obedience to God, there are days where we work at it with the wrong heart. We work at it really hard because we think if we are really good today, God's going to love me more. My Father's going to smile today if I'm really obedient today. I'm going to get a blessing from God today. Maybe I'll get an answer to prayer today, if I, if I pray a little more, a little longer, a little more fervently, I, I read a little more scripture, if I do a, a couple more kind things, maybe if I, I live a life that's pleasing to God, he'll get us out of this COVID thing a little more quickly, or my kids will find work, or whatever. Again, it's, it's the danger of that attitude and heart of the older brother seeping into our attitude and heart as we relate to our Father. If you are a Christian, you can't do anything to earn more love from your Father. You can't do anything to earn more love and acceptance from God. He's given you all of His love and all of His acceptance in the Lord Jesus Christ. Through repentance and faith, it is all yours. Guard your heart, and this is... Now, by extension, I'll I'll give this to you to think about and pray about. Search out some scriptures. Do not look to obey God so that He will love you. Pursue passionate, deliberate obedience to God because He does love you. Don't work hard every day to be a better person so that God will forgive you and accept you. Give your life fully and completely in service for Him because He does love and accept you in Christ. Those are two massively different pictures. One leads to destruction and a complete joylessness of life. The other leads straight to the Father's heart and a celebration of joy. So where are you? It's interesting, this passage ends. There's no answer to the question, what does the older brother do? Jesus leaves the religious leaders and us with the question, what will you do? Will he join the celebration? Or will he stay outside of the Father's heart? Listen, and I'll close with this. Jesus has come calling sinners to repentance. Already Luke 5, again in Luke 7, he's made that very clear. His mission from the Father is to come to call sinners to repentance and to rescue those sinners, how? Through the cross. 
This passage we're reading, we've already been told Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem and the cross is coming. This is helping us understand why does Jesus have to die? It's so that repentant sinners, like this son, like you and like me, that through repentance and faith we can actually be forgiven. God will deal with our sin. And Jesus is the one with whom the Father deals with the sin. That's why he gives his life up on the cross, so that you and I can be forgiven. In this climax to his mission, as he hangs there on that cross, ultimately going into the tomb, but being raised from the dead, in this seek and rescue mission, he is fulfilling the heart of the Father. This this is what life and time and history is all about, that God might display his heart of love in rescuing lost sinners. Now listen, Jesus is calling rebellious, selfish, self-destructive, ugly sinners to repentance and salvation through faith. And Jesus is calling religious, hard-working, rule-keeping, self-righteous, hypocritical sinners to repentance and life through faith in Jesus Christ. And I suspect there are some of you this morning who are still ruined and lost in your sin and you are feeling far from home and filthy and just completely inadequate to make any approach to God. You are afraid to come. You are nervous about the reception. The same way a a disobedient child is nervous to confess to mom or dad what they've done. You are nervous to come. You don't know how they might respond. You don't know how the Father might respond to you. You fear a cold rejection because your sin is larger than anybody else's sin. If you are in that category this morning, read this passage and pray that God would show you His heart. It is full of love and warmth for repentant sinners. You need only go to Him. And acknowledge you were wrong and he was right. And embrace him through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't stay in the darkness. Don't stay out in the cold. Don't disqualify yourself. God knows your sin better than you do. He is well able to forgive it because Jesus died and rose again. And at the same time, I feel there are likely some of you who are still ruined in your self-righteousness and your religious pride. You live in a cold and joyless darkness of religious achievement and you are trying to save yourself and earn God's approval through your sacrifices and your life's obedience. And you have not felt the warmth of His arms and the power of His grace because you think you can save yourself. And I would plead with you in this moment, you cannot that heart will keep you from entering into the Father's joy, I would plead with you to turn from that sin of self-righteousness and acknowledge that He is right and you were wrong. You have forfeited any rights to sonship, but He will receive you as His child if you will embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I promise you this, Jesus died for hypocrites, the religious type and otherwise, and Jesus will forgive. And Jesus is calling all of us today into a restored relationship with our Heavenly Father. He's calling us into fellowship with family through the door of humble faith and repentance, through that door which is opened up in the sacrifice, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And He's calling us to receive in the Father's heart a great storehouse of grace, a treasure of divine love, and an inheritance of glory and joy. Jesus is calling you home today. He's calling you to his Father's heart today. Won't you come in? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger And heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me. Oh, for that wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come home, all you who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, O sinner, come home. Amen.